Okay, we're rolling on A. Rolling B. Okay? Yeah. Rolling? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming. Why did you write the book? Well, I had, I'm a political scientist. So I do international politics. In the 90s, I spent many years writing a very long book, which I finished in 99. And I was looking for something different. I didn't want to just keep repeating what I had said in that book. Um, so I think I was open to something completely different. Um, and then I happened upon a book at a bookstore um, by Dana Zohar on this idea of a quantum mind, just casual reading. And I read the book and I was just totally captivated by it and realized that, wow, this, this is like really important. But her book was written for kind of a more trade audience. And so I wanted to write a more academic version of the book. Um, and I just basically got bit by this quantum bug um, and started writing. So the main idea of the book is that human beings are walking wave functions. Background to that idea is that human consciousness and therefore human subjectivity is a macroscopic quantum mechanical phenomenon. So whatever weirdness is going on at the subatomic level is also going on at the human level. Classical phenomena that we're familiar with in everyday life in the Newtonian mechanics um, and our conception of material objects, um, our conception of causality. All of that breaks down at the subatomic level, and so we get all this sort of entanglement stuff that's going on, non-deterministic phenomena, non-local causation, a lot of things that the physicists themselves have documented and proven, but they don't know how to interpret or make sense of it. They've been debating it for now 80 years, trying to make sense of what's going on. The social sciences um, have drawn on physics, I think, from the beginning. Uh, in the 19th century, it was actually very explicit. A lot of the founders of the social sciences looked to physicists for metaphors, ideas, equations, everything. Um, some of that was metaphorical, but I think they also uh, drank the Kool-Aid in the sense that they really bought into the worldview that was at that time a, mo a monolithic worldview of classical physics, that this is how the world is. And that worldview was never challenged in the social sciences. That actually in the 1920s, when the physicists were up in arms about the quantum revolution, the social scientists lost interest in physics, and basically the quantum revolution passed us completely by. And so we've never actually had a quantum revolution in social science, or even a debate about quantum mechanics. And we've continued on with our classical assumptions that we inherited in the 19th century. I think the reason that it was ignored is partly because the belief which is still held by many physicists that quantum mechanics only applies at the subatomic level or in isolated instances at the macro level, but certainly not to human beings. And in particular, that um, quantum processes could not possibly survive in a wet and noisy environment like the brain. Um, and so if the brain can't be quantum mechanical, then clearly human beings are not quantum mechanical and therefore social life is not either. So and that's a principled argument. Um, which has a good and long-standing rationale for it. I, I think it's wrong, but it's still there. And um, if that's true, then there is no place for social science to go quantum mechanical. Within philosophy, I think the core problem that I'm interested in is um, consciousness and where it comes, the mind-body problem, and specifically where does consciousness come from. And the debate about consciousness, as far as I can tell, has been stuck and, and has moved forward not at all for three centuries. Um, because all sides share the same basic assumption, which is that matter is purely material. And it's a classical view of matter, and so then the challenge is, okay, how do you get dead classical matter to produce consciousness? And that's a problem that they can't, they seem to be completely unable to solve, and I don't think it could be solved. Um, and that is the same assumption that I think is underlying the classical view of the mind in social science. Um, and I think within the social science context, we have this long-standing epistemological debate between positivists and interpretivists, and that's all about consciousness and what to do with it. So that debate is really our own local manifestation of the mind-body problem in philosophy. And again, it's an underlying assumption that both sides share, which is that the foundation of this debate is a classical view of matter. But if the mind is in fact quantum mechanical, that means all of our interactions and the way both with nature but also with each other um, are going to exhibit quantum characteristics, entanglement, non-locality, 
to the extent then that human beings share the same kinds of minds, and in particular I make the argument in the book that language is what enables us to share minds, to the extent that we share language and share institutions, those institutions and languages will themselves be quantum mechanical because they, after all, have to be physical too. I mean, one of the assumptions of the book is that everything has to be physical. It's just that physical doesn't mean material, and that's a key distinction that I make in the argument. So what does entanglement look like in the social context? I think what it looks like is, um, in part, that human actions are going to be correlated, even if they're not causally connected. The example that I like to use a lot with my students is what happened to Socrates' wife, Xantippe, when Socrates drank the hemlock and was forced to commit suicide. Well, she became a widow. And that becoming a widow happened instantaneously. There was no causal connection between Socrates drinking the hemlock and her becoming a widow. It was by definition she became a widow. And that definitional or constitutive relationship between them as husband and wife, that is an example, I think, of um, semantic uh, entanglement or non-locality and action at a distance. So something happens over here, no causal connection, boom, she's a widow. That kind of example is pervasive in social life. Interesting choice of example. Socrates drank hemlock because society couldn't tolerate his ideas. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's one of those long silences we like. <laughs> Are you doing something very dangerous here? It's certainly risky professionally. I'm wandering into territory that I'm not a physicist. I'm not a philosopher of mind. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work to, to write the book. I mean, it took me 10 years and I've tried to do as much homework as I could, but I don't have the training that the physicists have, the philosophers have, and so on. Um, so it's professionally risky in that sense. Um, it's also risky in the sense that um, I think people are either going to love the argument or they're going to hate it. Um, they're going to think it's complete nonsense or they're going to think it's great. And there's not going to be a lot of opinion in the middle, is my prediction. I think it challenges everybody in my own home field of international relations to think again. Um, it challenges the positivists who um, ignore consciousness and all their models are based on classical mechanics. But it also challenges all the post-positivists and interpretivists who reject natural science as a model for social life. In the quantum context um, in general, realism is one of the issues that's at stake in the philosophical debate about how to make sense of quantum mechanics. Because in the lab, it's, it's not as if the particle ex has an independent existence from the physicists. The physicist's measurement actually creates, in, well, not creates, but uh, elicits the particle, so to speak. So realism is contested within the philosophical community about physics. And by the same token, in the social context, um, I do think there is a social reality out there, um, but whenever we're measuring it, we're eliciting it. It's not existing independent of not just social scientists, but any of us. Um, and the example I use in the book is, you know, if aliens were serving the planet, would they see states and institutions of any kind? And no, they wouldn't. They would just see people. Um, and so all the stuff that we talk about as social scientists are, are invisible phenomena. And my argument is that these are actually quantum potentials that only exist when people measure them. Well, quantum coherence is, is a situation in which all the particles in some uh, system are coherent, which means they're not constantly uh, decohering or breaking apart and doing their own thing. So they maintain a unity over time. Um, and that's a process that has to be sustained by the body, which is obviously very complex and so on. Um, but if it can be sustained, then my argument is that you can have consciousness that is sustained over time as well. Part of the challenge in the argument is from going, is going from the individual level to the social level. And um, my claim is that quantum coherence is present not only within the individual brain, but also within social institutions. If those institutions are coherent, that means that um, somehow there's a unity that's sustaining them over time. And that unity is basically all of us individuals acting on the rules and norms of those institutions um, again and again in more or less the same way. If we were all acting against the rules, then the institution would collapse and you would have decoherence of those institutions. 
both neuroscientists and social scientists, um, that their images of the mind and the, and the brain and consciousness very much reflect current technology. Um, and if you look back the 17th century versus 19th century, you get very different pictures of what's going on because of the level of technology at the time. So if quantum computation takes off, and it looks like it's ramping up pretty quickly, my expectation is that this will make it much easier for both neuroscientists and social scientists to accept the idea that the brain is a quantum comp computer. Uh, in addition, I make the claim, though, that if quantum coherence is really the essence of life, and quantum computers involve creating quantum coherence, that when we create quantum co co computers, we are actually creating life, that those machines will be alive. Um, I don't know what the quantum computation people would say about that, but I think they're in the business of creating life, actually, if those can be uh, sustained over time. I see that kind of statement keeps Elon Musk awake at night. He thinks quantum artificial intelligence is going to surpass human intelligence. We may be creating, um, or in the process of creating, um, beings like ourselves. Whether they can um, have sex and reproduce themselves, that's another issue. The quantum consciousness crowd, led by Hameroff and others, um, are vigorously defending their argument against many critics. Uh, that debate is getting more and more sophisticated, but clearly the jury is still out. Technology just isn't there um, to prove it. And if it can't be proven there, it can't be proven in the social science context either. On the other hand, I will say that the quantum decision theory people um, have increasingly strong experimental evidence that people behave quantum mechanically. That may not have anything to do with consciousness, and they themselves don't want to make that link. But that's very strong evidence, it seems to me. In fact, extraordinarily powerful evidence that something's going on that's not supposed to be going on, namely something quantum mechanical at the macro level. The reason to take the argument seriously is first just because it puts an alternative on the table. And we've all taken this classical view for granted completely for over a century. And here's something quite different with very different implications across the board. And we need to, I think, just confront those possibilities and put them up against classical ones. I think that this argument is too simple and explains and does so much useful work and it solves so many problems that it's too elegant not to be true. There are very high startup costs for the argument. You've got to get some grip on quantum mechanics and then everything else, quantum decision theory. I mean, I had to learn all this stuff too because I didn't know any of this and I had to teach myself and then communicate it to my peers who also don't know this stuff. It is complex, but in the end, at the end of the day, it's actually extraordinarily simple. It's a matter of learning certain kinds of math that social scientists are not trained in. And actually, I think one of the most powerful and, and maybe provocative implications of the argument is to force social scientists to think about the methods training we give to our graduate students. We're teaching them classical probability theory, classical decision theory, classical game theory. This is all wrong. We're teaching them to see the world in classical terms. We should be teaching them quantum probability theory, quantum game theory, and so on. And I'd like to see the methodologists have a discussion about that and justify why they're doing the one rather than the other. And so far, the questions never come up. But once we train people to think quantum mechanically in terms of methods, I think it will become actually much easier to do this stuff on empirically and theoretically. You know, I think part of the job of being an academic is to say things that people wouldn't otherwise think of saying. So this is my attempt to do that.